we're turning to Daniel chapter 1, and in verse 1, uh, we're just going to read uh, through this together. Pray that the Lord will speak to your own heart as he's ministered to ours. Daniel chapter 1, and commencing to read at verse 1. <clears throat> in, the, in, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, uh, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of uh, Judah, into the hand, or into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Sinai to the house of of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Asphasas, the, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the kings, or certain of the children of Israel, and the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed, that, appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them there uh, three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God give, or God brought, or now God had brought Daniel into favor and love, tender love with the princes of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse lightning than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king." Then said Daniel uh, to Melzar, uh, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest deal with thy servants. So he consented to them, in, the, in this matter, and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat of the portion of the king's meat. Verse 17, And as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the princes of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them. And among all that was found, none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And we trust the Lord will add his blessing to the public reading of his word. Just bow with me just one moment before we continue on. Father, we just come again before thee. We thank thee for the hymns that we've sang. We thank thee for the passage of the word of God that we have read. And we just ask thee now that you'll come and speak to all of our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you'll fill me afresh. Take away, O oh God, the fear of man and nerves or whatever would seem to hinder us. We pray that indeed that thou will come and minister to all of our hearts. We ask it in the precious, worthy name of thy Son. Amen. I heard someone say recently that there's some things that none of us have control over. One of those things that none of us have control over is when we were born or where we were born. You know, there's those in the Word of God and they were born in good times. You take those who were born in the reign of King David, those who were brought up in the reign of King Hezekiah or 
King Josiah. And they were brought into a time and a realm of time whenever there was good kings upon the throne. There was those who were born in bad times. And such was this young man, Daniel. You know, he was one of the princes that dwelled in the palace in Jerusalem. He maybe was part of the royal line, I don't know, but he was one of these men, as you could say, he was riding the crest of the wave. He had the best clothing, he had the best food, he had the best upbringing. And he was a young man that was well privileged, a young man that was well positioned. But you know, there was a year in Daniel's life that he never forgot. It was 606 BC. That was the year that King Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Chaldeans, gathered his armies and they marched from Babylon and they came to the walls of Jerusalem and they besieged it and they took it. Daniel was, they tell us, about 14 years of age, just a young man. I want you to picture him just for a moment or two this morning. Here's a young man untainted by the world, and the enemy has come. And he has come in like a flood. And he takes away Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He takes away the princes and the line of the king's seed from Jerusalem. And he takes him to Babylon. And among those men was young Daniel. A young man carried away from his family and from his friends. We heard last Sunday morning, there's those and they know the best of times. And it can change very quickly to the worst of times. This is what happened to Daniel. 606 BC was a year I'm sure started and it was the best of times. I tell you, before that year went out, it was the worst of times. And here was this young man, Daniel. He was carried away, far, far away from his family, far, far away from his city where he was brought up and his friends, carried into ungodly Babylon. But you know, there's some things that were in Daniel's life that stood him in good stead in the day of trouble. And I want to talk to you about them this morning. I tell you, dear friends, there's some things that stood him in good stead in the days of trouble. And they'll stand you and I in the days of trouble. I don't know what 2019 could bring for you. I don't know what 2019 could bring for me. But I want to say to you this morning, if we base our life upon this young man, Daniel, and learn some of the truths that we're going to hear this morning, I'll tell you, dear friends, you'll be able to stand the face, fiercest trial. You'll be able to stand the fiercest gales and temptations and tests of life. Young Daniel did. The first thing I want you to talk, think about this morning that Daniel had, he had a conversion. A conversion. There was a day in this young man's life when he began a personal relationship with God Almighty. Oh, we don't read about it here. And I know my reading this morning maybe wasn't that good. You know, I was, whenever I was younger, my reading was five years behind anyone else. And I struggle at times when I'm reading large portions of the Word of God, but I'm sure you'll forgive me for that. But Daniel, there was a day in his life when he was converted. Here's a question to some young man in the lifeboat as you come to the end of 2018. Have you ever been converted? Has there ever been a day when you bowed your knee and lifted your heart to heaven and cried, oh God, will you save me? I tell you, there's a day whenever I did that. There was a day when our brother did it. There was a day when many in this meeting did it. Let me ask you, have you ever done it? I tell you, Daniel, away back in Jerusalem, there's a few things this young man learned. He learned about the reality of God. There's those and they belittle God. There's those and they mock and deride God. I'll tell you, dear friends, let them mock, let them scorn, and let them laugh. There's coming a day when we'll all stand before God. Genesis says in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God. I tell you, this young man, Daniel, he was alive at the time whenever Jeremiah came into the palace, you know. He would have read that awesome passage in Jeremiah chapter 8, maybe even heard it from the lips of the people of Israel. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. 
Ah, he learned about the reality of God. He would have been able to look at the scroll of Isaiah. And he would have been able to turn over to Isaiah chapter 6 and read about that great experience. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up. He knew something about the reality of God. I'll tell you tonight, this morning, dear friends, this world is interested in fiction. And they're interested in novel. I'll tell you a fact this morning. God is on the throne. God is real. I'll tell you, this young man, Daniel, realized that. He realized that he wasn't just playing games. He knew there was a God. Not only did he learn something about the reality of God, I'll tell you, he learned something about the majesty of God. Here was this young man, Daniel, 14 years of age, and he would have knew all about the temple of Solomon. He would have knew all about the glass of the sea of glass and the gold, picturing the majesty of God. He would have read Isaiah 57 and heard about the high and the lofty one, the one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, the majesty of God. He would have learned about the, the hatred that God had for sin. He would have learned something of whenever Adam and Eve was in the garden and whenever they sinned, that God drove them out of the garden and there was separation between God and man. This young man learned that. I'll tell you another thing he learned away back in Jerusalem. He learned something about the ability of God. He would have knew, known well the first five books of the Old Testament, probably off by heart. He would have read the great stories of Moses and how the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage and brought them through the Dead Sea. How he brought the manna from heaven and the quail that fed them every morning. He would have known about the ability of God, the majesty of God. I tell you, there's a day whenever Daniel got down on his knees and he prayed, I'm sure like the psalmist David, have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercy, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. You know the day that he did that, dear friends, you know what happened? Daniel was converted. Converted. I'll tell you this morning, dear friends, I thank God there's a day in my life when God converted me. Converted. Oh, you say to me, Stephen, what did he convert you from? He converted me from darkness to light. He converted me from death to life. He converted me from the power of Satan unto the power of God. Converted. I tell you, dear friends, this morning, we have every right to shout and sing. Converted. I tell you, there's a day, New Year's Eve, a few years ago, I would have been taken with drinking, drugs, and fighting. One day I was converted. And I tell you, I don't want to do those things anymore. Because there's a day when the Lord changed my life. Converted. Converted. I'll tell you, dear friends, Daniel was converted. You know what that tells me? Whenever the enemy comes, dear believer, and whenever the tempests of life rise and the gales of the devil may blow against us, thank God we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. I thank God this morning, those of us that are safe in the days of trial, we've got a good stand. Good stand. I tell you, here's a young man, Daniel. Picture him now walking down the long, dusty road out of Jerusalem. They're heading to Babylon. Oh, he doesn't know what's going to lie in front of him. He doesn't know what, what uh, 606 BC is going to stand for him. But one thing he does know, there's a day I can look back to and say, God came into my life. I was converted. The one who saved me will keep me. The one who plucked me from the brands of the devil will protect me and look after me. And the family may go and all the rest of it, but I've got an anchor that keeps us so. Convert. I'll tell you not only had this young man had he had a conversion, I'll tell you what else will stand us, dear friends, in good stead in the time of trial. His good companion. Good companion. Here's this young man, man, Daniel. And he has three friends that we read about this morning. Hannah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
I'll tell you, dear friends, this morning, as a believer, never you think for one moment that you're an island. Never you think for one moment that you can get through life on your own, for you can. You need to have good companions. You need to have good friends. You know, I was thinking yesterday afternoon about Job's friends. You remember he had three friends. I'll tell you, those three men came and they were hard and they were cold. They were unkind to him. They were unforgiving. I'll tell you another thing they were. They were very unhelpful. For seven days and seven nights they sat beside him and they never said a word. And after seven days and seven nights, you know what they did? They aimed their guns upon him and for seven or eight chapters they unleashed their wrath upon this man Job who was lying in the gutter, as it were. I'll tell you, there weren't much, there weren't much friend, many good friends to him, sure there weren't. And they accused him of sin. And they accused him of being a transgressor in the sight of God. You know what Job said in Job chapter 16? He says, ye are miserable comforters. Miserable. You know, I was thinking about it, I guess let me digress just for one moment. Not only was the trial a test for Job, but you know, dear friends, whenever others go through tests, it's a trial for us how we will react. Whenever we see a brother and he's down and the enemy is his foot on his neck, ah, not only is it a test for that brother, I tell you it's a test for you and me. What are we going to do? Will we criticize? Will we ridicule him or get in front of men and women and run him down? I tell you, these three friends of Job, they failed, you know. What about David? He had a friend called Ahithophel. Ah, he fought beside him. He stood in battles. He was his right-hand man. You know what David said in Psalm 41? He says, Mine own familiar friend in whom I had trusted, who ate of my own bread, he has lifted up his heel against me. I trust this morning, dear friends, if you're a friend to anyone, you'll be a good friend. And you'll not criticize them. And you'll not backbite them. Because I'll tell you this, dear friends, you will know as well as I will. They're no better than you. No better. We all have our failings. We all have our inconsistencies. But I'll tell you there's a few things about these friends of Daniel. First of all, they were spiritual friends. If I could say anything to some young people in this meeting this morning, if you're going to get friends, get friends that are spiritual. You know, you take the three names of these young men, Hanai, that means beloved of Jehovah. I tell you, you would be in good company of a man that's beloved of God, wouldn't you? Daniel was in good company. You take the man, young man called Mishael, his name means who is as my God. You'd be in good company whenever you're in his company. Then you'll get Azariah, it says Jehovah is my help. I tell you, dear friends, Daniel was in good company. There wouldn't have been much backbiting among these young men. There wasn't much slandering among them. They were young men that were spiritual. I'll tell you another thing about them. These friends of Daniel, they were supportive. Turn over there to chapter 2 just for one moment. In chapter 2 and verse 17, you'll remember it was there in chapter 2 where Daniel uh, comes before the king. He has a dream and Nebuchadnezzar is going to kill all the wise men of Babylon. You remember what Daniel did? This is what he did in verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known unto Haniel, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel. I'll tell you, dear friends, this morning, you get friends around you that you can pray with. Here was Daniel in a trial in his life, only a young man, 22 years of age, standing before the king Nebuchadnezzar. And what he does is he goes home and back to his house with three young men. And he gathers them around him and says, Lads, we need to pray. We need to cry unto God for this situation. 
You know what happened whenever they did? It says in verse 19, then was the secret revealed. I'll tell you, I'm looking forward to tomorrow night. I'll honestly say that. I'm looking forward in spite of who's here and who's not here to get into this little room at half ten and to cry unto God with other men and other women. Because the God that did it for Daniel can do it for me. I tell you, he had spiritual friends. I would like to commend those of you in this meeting this morning that I could pray with. There's those in this meeting this morning and I could go to you at any time of the day with any trial and I could put my hand on your shoulder and share with you the burden and concern of my heart. And I know that you would pray with me and I would commend you for that. And I trust I would be the same to you as what you would be to me. You know, that's what Daniel had. Friends that were supportive. They were behind one another. I tell you, whenever the enemy comes, friends, it's good to be behind one. But not only were these friends of Daniel supportive, I tell you another thing, they were steadfast. These three young men, you'll remember in uh, chapter 3, they wouldn't bow the knee to the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. They wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bargain, and they wouldn't give in. These three young men were consistent. These three young men stood, and they stood for God. I'll tell you, dear friends, if we need friends, we need friends that are steadfast, that will stand on the Word of God, whether it costs them their life or whether it doesn't. And they're steadfast. I'll tell you, they were friends that stood with Daniel through thick and thin. We all have those in our lives, I'm sure we've met them, and they're called fair weather friends. But I'll tell you, here was three young men and they stood with Daniel. I would like to share with you a thought that came to me in the road over this morning. It's good to have friends that are steadfast and supportive. Thank God for the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Whenever other companions can't come near us and whenever they're nowhere to be found and the situations would uh, come about that they couldn't be near us and help us, thank God there's one that sticketh closer than a brother. Good friend. Thank God he's a good friend. Not only had this young man got a conversion and not only had this young man uh, got good companions, I'll tell you another thing this young man had. He had character. Character. I haven't got time to go into this this morning, for I want to skip on through this. But here was a young man. And do you read about what his enemies said about him? Wicked King Nebuchadnezzar said, I know that in thee dwelleth the Spirit of the Holy God. Here was a young man, 22 years of age, controlled, filled, and endued with the Spirit of God. And I tell you, dear friends, his very enemy saw it. It doesn't matter what your friends say. I wonder what our enemies say. You know what Nebuchadnezzar's daughter said? She says, I know that in him dwelleth the Spirit of the Holy God. Darius, that wicked king, in chapter 5 says, Daniel, I know that in you dwells an excellent spirit. I tell you, dear friends, here was a young man, and as even his enemies knew that he was filled with the Spirit of God. He was a young man who was totally surrendered, totally yielded, totally given over to God, lock, stock, and barrel, in spite of the trials, in spite of the suffering, in spite of the afflictions. He was filled with the Spirit of God. I'll tell you, dear friends, is that why we're dry? Is that why there's very few amens? Is that why there's very few praises from God's people? Because we're empty. We have nothing to praise Him for. I'll tell you, you take the fruit of the Spirit whenever you go home in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You read Daniel chapter 1 to Daniel chapter 6. You'll find every single one of them in this young man. The fruit of the Spirit was flowing from him. Ah, you never hear of him preaching. You'll never hear of him giving his testimony or standing on the street corner with an amplification speaker doing an open air. His life was a witness. And his very enemies were testimony to. 
I'll tell you, dear friends, that should convict us. For with all of her preaching and with all of her testimonies, I'll tell you the world seems to know very little about us. Here is a young man that was, had a character that was given over to God. It's interesting in chapter 6 there, whenever Daniel was put into the den of, den of lions, it's in chapter 6 that the, the presidents and the, the princes sought to find fault with Daniel. It says that they found, sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion against him. Couldn't find a fault in his business life. They couldn't find a fault in his home life. They couldn't find a fault in his church life. They found no occasion against him. You know, it's interesting that there's not one fault recorded from Genesis to Revelation about this young man. Not one fault. I'm not saying he was faultless. But here was a young man that stood before God blameless because he lived in the Spirit of God. Let me ask you a question before you go on. Did you get out of your bed this morning and surrender your life to the Lord? Do you say, Lord, fill me afresh with your Spirit? I'll tell you, dear friends, it's vital. It's vital to be filled with the Spirit of God. Vital. Here's a young man who had good companion. Here's a young man that had a conversion. Here's a young man that had character. I tell you, it stood him in good stead. I'll tell you another thing this young man had. He had conviction. Conviction. I want you to picture in your mind now this young man, 14 years of age, going into Babylon, a city that he has never seen before. And King Nebuchadnezzar had set before them a three-year course of rehabilitation. They're far away from their land, far away from their family, and so Nebuchadnezzar enrolls them into the University of Babylon. For three whole years, he wants them to forget the God of Israel and the house of their fathers. He wants to brainwash them with the, with the theology of the world. He wants to school them in the language and the learning of Babylon and their immorality and their idolatry. And of course, the best way to tell a man's heart is through his mouth, isn't it? So Nebuchadnezzar feeds him of the portion of his own meat, the best wine and the best food that the land of Babylon had ever seen. It says that he provided daily a provision of the king's meat and his wine. And here's this young man on day, chapter, day number one in the University of Babylon. And he stands there, and there's those of his comrades and friends from Jerusalem that are standing there. I don't know how many of them there was. And then this man, Aphaz, comes in, the head of the eunuchs. And they're all sitting at their little dinner tables. And Aphaz comes in, and he says, Now, men, the, the priest of Nebo is going to give thanks for the food. And the priest of Nebo comes into that dinner hall that day and he lifts his hands and he cries, O oh God, Nebo, we give thee thanks for your daily provision of this food and of this meat. We pray that you will bless it to these young men and that you will, inst you will instruct them in wisdom and in knowledge. Amen. And the doors open and the, the caterers come out. And they cover the tables of these young men with dishes that they had never seen before. Oh, they had their bacon baps and they had their rabbit and they had their crab and their oyster. And it looked so appetizing to their, to their appetite. And there's those and they begin to tuck into the food. Oh, Daniel, this is lovely. I have never tasted this before. Isn't it great? And Daniel, he sits, pushes the plate away. He says, man, I can't touch that. Daniel, why will you not eat it? Ah, oh, he says, young man, before I left my home, 
Before I left Jerusalem, I purposed in my heart that I would not defile myself with the portion of the king's meat. I say to you tonight, this morning, dear friends, in 2019, the cry of my heart would be, God, give us men and women with conviction. Give us men and women that will stand on the word of God with all of their might, in spite of what others may say, in spite of what others may do. Here was a young man, Daniel, and he remembered Leviticus chapter 21, that he should not touch an unclean animal or anything that was offered to an idol or anything that was strangled, nor he shouldn't touch blood. And here was Daniel, and he says, I have set a boundary in my life, and I'm not going to break the word of God. I'm going to stand on the word of God with all of my might. Spurgeon said this. He said, child of God, learn to say no. And it'll be more beneficial than learn, learning to speak a lot. Learn to say no. Here's a word to some of you young people. In God's name, learn to say no. I wish I had learned to say that whenever I was young. For I wouldn't have broke my mother's heart for four years. Or my father. Just one little word. No. And here is this young man, Daniel. And he stood up. And he says, I am not going to break the word of God and I'm not going to defile myself with the portion of the king's meat. And I can hear those at the dinner table saying to Daniel, Daniel, others are doing it. You read in verse 10 and you'll find that others did do it. Daniel, others are doing it. You'll be all right. Just you tag along, man. Daniel says, I can't. I've got convictions in my heart. I'm not going to break the word of God. I'm not going to grieve the one who saved me. I've got boundaries in my life. And I'm not going to step over them. I can hear another friend say, but Daniel, you just keep the peace now. I tell you, you're in Babylon. Don't do anything that will upset the cart. Don't do anything that will grieve the enemy. What you need to learn to say, Daniel, is compromise. That was the word that Oxford said was the word of 2018, was the word compromise. It was used more in 2018 to tell me than any other year. Compromise. I'll tell you, dear friends, I pray that God will give us men in the lifeboat and women that will not compromise. They'll not compromise that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that Muhammad can't do it, Karl Marx can't do it, just uh, uh, any of those other false gods, they can't do it, that there's only one Savior. I give us men that will stand on the doctrines of the Word of God and say, hell or high water, I believe it and I'll stand on it in spite of what others may say. Oh, I can hear Daniel, one of his friends say, Dan, you're very narrow-minded. That's what's wrong with you. You're too narrow-minded, Daniel. You're medieval in your thinking. Ah, Daniel says, you say what you want. I have purposed in my heart that I will not defile myself with the king's I hear another friend say, sure, Daniel, we could use this, you know, to our advantage. We could actually use this to witness to others. Daniel, we could use this as a means of drawing alongside others and one another. I'll tell you, dear friends, I'm absolutely sick and tired of hearing that excuse. Absolutely tired. I'll tell you, dear friends, if you want to win the alcoholic, you don't need to become an alcoholic to win them. If you want to save the drug addict, you don't need to take drugs. What you need to do is bring the Savior to them. I'll tell you, here was a young man and he stood in his conviction. I can hear another man saying, say, now, Daniel, no one else will know. You're thousands of miles away from home, man. No one will know. Daniel says, I've got a conscience in my heart and I'm not going to break. Oh, give us men like that. Give us men like that. Men that have a conviction. Men that have a conscience. You remember young Joseph whenever he stood there and Potiphar's wife came. And I tell you, I'm sure she was one of the most beautiful women that ever walked the earth. You know what Joseph said? How can I do this great sin, this great evil and sin against God? Because he had set before he even went to Egypt 
a boundary in his life. I hope this morning, dear friends, and I don't want to sound hard, I hope that you have set boundaries in your home for your children. I trust that you have set boundaries in your own life. Because here is a young man, Joseph, 14, 15 years of age, set a boundary in his life. Not only had he boundaries, I'll tell you another thing he had, he had boldness. Why he had boldness? It says, therefore, he requested. Here was this young man, Daniel, and he was sitting at the table, seeing the pork, seeing the rabbit, seeing the crab. He pushed the plate away from him. And he got up and he walked over to the prince of the eunuchs and he says, sir, there's a little bit of an issue. Have a wee problem. I can't touch, I can't touch that knee. He says, Daniel, what's wrong? He says, sir, I, I'm not being arrogant and I'm not being rude. If I was to touch that, I would become unclean before God. You know, he didn't go in with a placard or a billboard. He didn't chain himself to the floor of the canteen. Here was a young man that had a conviction. Thank God he was courteous. Courteous. I'll tell you, dear friends, we can win our enemies. Very quickly in closing, he not only had he boundaries and backbone, but here was a young man at blessing. If you want blessing in 2019, friend, you stand for God. You stand for him with all of your might in spite of what those that you work with will say, in spite of what those that live with you will say, in spite of those in the church, what they will say, you stand and stand on the word of God. Paul had it right. He says, having done all to stand, stand ye there. I haven't got time to go into it this morning, but you see the blessings that God laid upon this man's life. He gave him favor with his enemies in verse 9. He increased him in knowledge and skill and learning and wisdom. And verse 17, the day came three years later whenever he was to stand before the king Nebuchadnezzar. Three years after his rehabilitation course. And he stood before that great king in all of his pomp and all of his pride and Daniel and his three friends, you know what it says? That Nebuchadnezzar had never seen young men like this before. They were ten times better than all the men he had ever seen before. I'll tell you, there was a physical difference in these young men. Even Nebuchadnezzar could see the difference. And the cry of my heart would be, 2019, give us men and women that have good, good companions. Men and women that have got good character, men and women that have got good conviction. And I tell you, dear friends, the world will take notice. You go home later on this evening and you study a little bit about David or Daniel's communion, his communion. It's interesting to note here was a young man who prayed at morning, noon and night, three times a day. It's interesting to note that there was no man in the word of God that was touched as much by the hand of God. Five times this young man had the touch of God laid upon him. Five times. Five times the hand of the Almighty rested upon Daniel. He could share secrets with him that have still got to be played out in the line of prophecy. Why? Why could God trust this young man? Why could God touch this young man? Why could God bless this young man? You want to know why? He had a conversion. Good companion. Good character. Good conviction. Good communion. God laid his hand upon him. I trust as we go into a new year, dear friends, that we'll try and be like this young man, Daniel. That God Almighty, his hand would rest upon us. Let us pray. Father, we just bow again in thy presence at the end of another meeting. And we just thank thee for your word to our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you'll raise us up as men and women with conviction. And that we'll stand on your word with all of our heart. And we'll purpose in our hearts not to defile ourselves with the things of this world and things that we would say in places where we would go and in things that we would watch. 
We pray that indeed that you'll keep us clean. Give us a year of blessing ahead of us, Lord. And we pray for those that must go. We pray that you will be with them and those of us that gather around your table, that our meditation of thy Son will be sweet. We ask it in the lovely, precious, and worthy name of thy Son. Amen.